Welcome. Um, thank you for joining us tonight for this talk, Inside Monash, Be the Designer that the World Needs. So my name is Scott. I'm part of the Monash Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture. I'm actually here just to do the techie stuff with my colleague Erin, who's behind the scenes, um, just to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So during tonight's talk, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat function and type the questions in. Uh, what we'll do uh, is we'll accumulate those questions as we go through the evening and then at the end, um, once our presenters uh, have finished, we will then ask the questions directly to them so they can give you um, a direct and verbal response to your questions. So if you've got anything, want to know anything about Monash Design, just type them in. All right, let's get to it. We'll start off with an acknowledgement to country. We would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities as the traditional custodians of the land that we all work and study on. We pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I recognise the sovereignty was never ceded. So our talk tonight, Inside Monash, Be the Designer the World Needs, was originally going to be presented by our Head of Design, Jean Bowden, but unfortunately Jean is unable to be with us tonight. But that's okay, because tonight we have two equally amazing designers with us. We've got Dr. Robbie Napper. Uh, he's a Senior Lecturer, Deputy Head of Education of the Design Department and an Industrial Designer. Uh, also, we have his colleague, Dr. Myra Thiessen, uh, lecturer in communication design and has a PhD. Her specialty was in typography and graphic design, among some other areas. So two great designers for you all to get to know, um, hear from and be able to ask them your questions. I will hand it over to Dr. Robbie now. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Scott. And I'm just going to share my screen and you can tell me whether that's working. Okay, so uh, thank you, Scott, and welcome everyone. Um, tonight's talk aims to really give you some insight into uh, how design fits into the world. And then also um, we'll be using some Monash examples, actually a lot of student work examples to show what that means. Um, over the course of the talk, we aim to give you an understanding of what it's like to study design at Monash and some of the things that we've been up to uh, recently. I'll also touch on some of the uh, commonly asked areas or common question areas uh, that we get at this time of year, which is what does the degree look like? What, what do I do in a design degree? Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll start with some of the overarching um, themes in design and I'll give a very brief overview of the degree and then I'll talk about some examples before I hand over to Myra to uh, finish the presentation and talk about some more examples of work. Uh, and yes, just to mirror Scott's uh, comments, I'm, I'm very happy to, to see the questions at the end. And, um, and also to, to add something, I suppose, to Scott's acknowledgement of uh, country, you know, we, we often start our presentations in design by acknowledging a really strong piece of design that is actually among us every day. And of course, talking about the Aboriginal flag here, which was designed by Harold Thomas. Um, that's a real strong connection for us here in design when we consider the power of this as a piece of communication design. It is quite profound. Um, so design at Monash. Um, many of you are familiar with Monash University, I think. Um, I often start this talk, and today's no exception, by just describing how design fits into Monash because universities can be such big, bewildering, um, unusual looking things. And um, I often forget, because I work within a university, how that looks from the outside. So universities are divided into faculties and today's talk is coming at you from my faculty, which is art, design and architecture. And within that faculty, that big group, there is a smaller thing called a department and that's the department of design. And that, that's our home turf uh, for tonight's talk. So we've gone from a, a very big thing, Monash University, all the way down to quite a small thing, which is the department of design. And we like to be small. Um, a little bit of reading uh, for tonight. It wouldn't be a university talk if I didn't give you a little bit of reading to do. Um, so I'm just going to pause for a moment while everybody takes this in.
And the thing I'd like to call out on this slide is this transformational agency of design. Um, the beginning of that second paragraph there. What we see design doing today is so much different to what we saw design doing a decade ago or more. Um, design used to be the, the, the domain of, of making solutions, whether they were physical or, or virtual, and, and that, was, that was kind of the stuff of design. And we see so much of that today, but we see so much more. We see this transformational agency. So a lot of work that I do as a design researcher is not actually to invent new things, although a lot of it still is, but a lot of it is to go in and actually be an agent for change. And, and that's the thing that I think we'll pick up quite a lot tonight. Another way I like to explain design is through this very magenta slide, um, which is some of the other things that design can do. Um, I, I love making stuff. I'm an industrial designer. You know, I like to sit at my desk and draw pictures of bicycles and then go out and test them and all this kind of stuff. But in doing so, I'm not just being a traditional industrial designer. What I'm doing is some of these things here. And, and, and these are some messages within our department that ring quite true for all of us as staff and that we, we bring students along on a journey with. And the first one is making possible. Sometimes design is required to take an idea from something which is not quite possible into the realm of, of possibility. I'd like to say at that point that we also work a lot with other people. So, you know, my best friend and worst enemy as a designer is an engineer. Um, other people's best friend and worst enemy are, are their clients. You know, we always work with other people. Uh, in design, we often make things tangible. So sometimes we have an idea or somebody we're working with has an idea, but they can't bring it to life. And that idea of making things tangible by drawing a picture or making a prototype or, or testing something out is very important. It's a very big part of design and it's, it's actually quite fun. Um, making visible seems obvious, but again, it's a bit like making tangible in that when we see things, we can talk about them. If they're just ideas in somebody's head, if they're not visible, it's very difficult to progress an idea. Um, and lately in my research, I've been doing a lot of this last one, this making sense. So I've been working on a project recently, which is to design safer roads for pedestrians and bicycle riders. And a lot of the work in that has not been drawing pictures of roads. It's actually been trying to make sense of what pedestrians want when they cross the road. And believe it or not, it's really complicated and, and really quite interesting. So I've been brought in as a designer in those projects to make sense of something which is quite complex uh, that can't be made sense of unless we have a holistic type of view. When, when this comes into fruition, what we see are some interesting outcomes. What we've got here is an artificial reef that was designed by a student. We've got a waste collecting system for the Yarra that really works. We've got something that transports blood in uh, hostile environments and keeps things like heart transplants working. All of these things are based on those things I covered earlier, the idea of making tangible, making sense. The, the award-winning characteristic of this um, Thermalife project was that it actually fit into the user requirements of um, blood transfusion transport in a better way than, than others have before. It was, it was in line with what people actually needed because they didn't need a gigantic truck with a fridge on the back because there's no fuel for it. So we had to come up with other ways. Um, of course, those are some industrial design activities um, and student projects. This is more of a spatial design project and um, there'll be some communication design projects that we look at later on as well. Um, this is uh, a typical of a montage type of activity where a student has created a rendering, added in photo materials to, to create an idea for a concept for a space. On campus is an interesting one at the moment. Um, obviously, it's been quite an exciting year for us with regard to things being on campus and then off again and sometimes on again and off again. Um, when our students get busy doing stuff in their own homes at the moment or sometimes on campus, as this image shows from earlier, uh, an earlier project, we, we do a lot of making visible. Uh, this was the great one about garbage and obviously we made it visible here just by tracing the uh, classic chalk outline um, but, but filling it with, um, with found garbage was, was a really revealing exercise. So um, I'll talk a little bit now about the Bachelor of Design. 
So um, you're probably familiar with at least one of these terms. Um, I dare say that a lot of our um, listeners today uh, will be audience today, I guess your audience, uh, are familiar with communication design. Um, this back in the day would have been called graphic design. Um, communication design is a much broader and, and more in-depth field than, than its forebear graphic design. Industrial design is the design of, of product system services experiences and spatial design is the design of spatial uh, outcomes, that is interior, exterior spaces, um, and even intangible um, spatial designs. There's a, there's a wonderful elective in there that I might get a chance to talk about later. Something that you may be familiar with is our fourth specialization called collaborative design. What we're finding in the market today for jobs uh, where our graduates go is that there is this space in between the disciplines that we call collaborative design, whereby it's possible for students to have very successful careers, not as one particular type of designer, but actually as something like what we call a collaborative designer, where their skill is in combining elements of the three more traditional domains in design. So what we've done is we've reflected this in our degree, uh, the Bachelor of Design. Now, this is the most techie slide that we're gonna show tonight. I'm, I'm not a fan of putting up huge diagrams, but hey, it is a good idea to tell you something about the degree structure. So here goes. We have a three-year Bachelor of Design. It's a three-year degree. It has an optional fourth year, and of course, there are further study options. But let's talk about the three years for a moment. In year one, semester one, we have a single shared collaborative studio called Collaborative Design Studio One. What this provides students with is a grounding in a great array of design skills and processes and even technologies that will feed into any of the design disciplines. From semester two, the second half of first year, students will go into a specialization stream, communication, industrial and spatial design. Now what can happen, and, and those degrees you progress through in a, in a sort of orderly fashion, I suppose. The exciting thing that can happen in year three is that you can re-engage with collaborative studio, having done some communication and maybe some spatial as a mix and become a collaborative designer. So in that third year, you can stick to communication, spatial or industrial, or you can go back into collaborative design for that uh, broader experience to, to really to access those new kinds of jobs that are out there. And I'm going to just take you through one of those projects now from the first year. Um, so year one, collaborative design. This is work from last semester. So um, this is stuff that was achieved under some very trying circumstances that we actually rose out of and, and had a terrific experience. The project was called People and Climate. So in this first year, first semester studio, this is the grounding that we give our students. There's a studio element to it. And studio is our word for, for doing design. Studio, it's a method, it's also kind of a place where you would go to do some work um, and it deals with the things in the blue box here. In the lab part of this class, we deliver technical skills. These are the things you must know to progress as a designer. We're talking about software and making in the main. And we also have a special session on photography because we believe that photography is such a fundamental skill for any designer that it's worth singling out some of those skills. I remember as an undergraduate first year student when I studied a long, long time ago, and I did a lot of photography and it stayed with me to this day. It's a very, very fundamental skill. It's really handy. And so we have projects like this. So this is Joanna's uh, project, which is on coral bleaching um, and it's part of a, a sort of broader team effort there, uh, making a range of observations about the built environment, about the things in our world, like plastic straws that aren't, aren't good at all. Um, and really creating some, some quite compelling artwork and, and design pieces, the, the white stuff on the uh, right of the screen here. It's just so cool. Um, another one by Alicia is really great, um, taking some very known, well-known quotes there by Greta Thunberg, but also creating this, this gigantic headpiece, um, which, I mean, the photograph on the left is, I'm such a fan, it's so moving. Um, and to think that this is, this is a well-resolved piece of communication design, but it's also made, it's a 3D object, it's been well photographed, there's, there's some wonderful stuff going on there. The plastic jacket, I'm a huge fan of, this is a jacket made of waste, um, 
I like the idea of walking down the street wearing this one. It's, it's quite a statement piece. You can see that it engages with a, with a further area of design fashion that we don't even teach at Monash, but we are so happy to engage with it. It's, it's such a, a part of communication design. Um, some nice process work here for, for how the jacket was sort of invented. And then of course, going through the usual technology of um, making patterns and, and actually building the jacket. I think it's actually quite warm. I haven't worn it myself. Um, this is cheeky, I like this one. These are frozen sneakers to remind us uh, about climate change and about the ice caps. Pretty compelling reminder there when you walk into a shop wearing frozen melting sneakers. Um, this one's cool as well. So um, it's a swimsuit that actually adjusts uh, color to tell you the pH of the ocean. So it's basically a wearable um, science experiment or, or science indicator. Um, we know that the oceans are acidifying um, and this swimsuit makes it all the more compelling to sort of document that. Again, process work for this is, is something that we're really keen on in first year. So we've got the use of scale models and sketches and mannequins before creating the final piece. And all of these pieces were actually created using waste materials. One of the, the nice things about this unit and this project was that we set the goal of students using only found materials. They weren't allowed to use anything that was sort of bought new. So, you know, we've got, you're going through uh, Nana's pile of wool here to, to find the materials to, to build this kind of thing. Um, great project here by Gitka as well. The, the idea of re uh, upcycling um, garments, which are originally made in sweatshops, is obviously quite a moving image. Um, uh, but the idea that it's actually made, you know, it's not just a, just a Photoshop type of thing, I think is, is really nice. There's a, there's a really compelling part to it. And really the examples roll on and I'm just keen to remind everybody that these are student works and these are actually first year students as well. So um, a year ago, they were in a position that I think a lot of you are in now, that is finishing school. So for part of this unit, we ran an Instagram hashtag. Uh, if you want to check it out, you can. Um, and a lot of our units do use Instagram. I use it myself in teaching. It's, uh, it's an easy way for me to keep track of what my students are up to actually. Um, but it's nice to have a public facing uh, version of that. Um, I'm gonna pass over to Myra now, and she's gonna tell us about a specific project, uh, which is on the screen now, and then take us through to the end with some of uh, the, the broader sort of Monash stuff. So Myra, over to you. Thanks, Ravi. Um, yeah, so I uh, would really like to talk just about this project, you know, and, and you know, as Ravi kind of alluded to, we found ourselves in a really um, curious trying time at the beginning of this year. Um, and so this, this project was, um, you know, a call to our students to respond to that time and um, give voice to some of, the, some of the things that we were experiencing. And, you know, starting out uh, with the bushfires, you know, it's long forgotten now because little do we, did we know that there would also be um, uh, COVID-19 turning up to change the way that, that we do a lot of things today. So um, um, one thing that's um, really important as you know, you think about the kind of designer you want to be and being a designer for the future kind of world that, that we are constructing um, is you know, being acutely aware of, of the environments and the contexts in which we live. Um, and you know, design is a really, uh, in, a, a really strong, powerful tool to be able to empower us, to challenge things that, that are you know, maybe expected ways of doing, questioning whether those are the right ways of doing it, and you know, drawing out calls, of, calls to action to make things better. So this um, project, uh, <laughs> this, we're coordinating ourselves, this project um, was you know, a way to, to uh, ask students to respond to how they're feeling in, um, in this quickly evolving, changing landscape that we found ourselves. Um, and I'd also like to point out that, it re that this is work that, that um, the students responded to in a week, you know, and, so, and some of the, the responses were, you know, really uh, powerful and breathtaking in lots of ways. Um, and also another way of disseminating, disseminating it was over Instagram, as Robbie also alluded to. Um, so, you know, this idea of 
um, you know, being acutely aware of your environment and and what that means and how it how it shapes and develops you as a designer. Uh, a part of that is, you know, becoming aware of other design, other cultures, pardon me, other environments and cultures uh, that exist in order to um, understand the broader landscape um, and also broaden your thinking. Um, and this is really important for shaping shaping your practice and the kind of designer that you want to be. Um, and really uh, focusing in then on um, understanding how things are connected and how we're influencing each other uh, around uh, our, our own environments, but also quite, quite a lot more broadly. So one thing that, um, that we offer at MADA is, you know, opportunity to study abroad and to do study tours. And you know, as as we move into a post-COVID world, and uh, you know, travel bans are lifted, then you know these opportunities will will hopefully be open to you again. Uh, but wonderful opportunity to, to look at at things more broadly. Next, yeah. So um, uh, you know, Robbie also alluded to uh, working in studios and this idea of this is where we do design. Um, and it is absolutely where that happens um, and where, where, again, your practice is shaped, but it's shaped through this idea of working together and sharing work and discussing work and, um, you know, agreeing meaning and understanding and, um, and ways of moving forward. And um, so this studio model is, is how, how we develop that that understanding and, and construct those meanings around these things. Um, and it's also really an important part of uh, becoming a prof professional practitioner and learning the vocabularies and, and the social practices that are part of studio culture. Um, and so that uh, working together and agreeing things uh, is something that that's developed right from the start. Um, and alongside that, then we have uh, you know, putting your work out in the world and sharing it and uh, critiquing and understanding then the, the social landscape and environments that that the work exists in and is um, and is shaping and changing and then how you're changing and people are changing in response to that. Um, so putting your work out uh, in front of your peers, uh, but into the world and looking and seeing how how it's being responded to um, is, is uh, uh, an important part of, of, again, shaping and developing your practice. Um, so, uh, and, you know, just further to that point is, you know, at MADA, we have, um, as part of your program of study, the opportunity to take on uh, a set of electives that that are supplemental to the core studio studio work and you know this is this is uh, um, an opportunity for you to develop a specialization and and delve really deep into one one kind of, of thing that you're really on fire for when it when it comes to shaping that practice for yourself but it but on the other side of that, it could also be a way for you to broaden the way that you think about your practice and looking at, at coursework that might be a little less traditional and how then that informs your practice. Um, so there is a range of, of electives to, uh, to help you shape that, that, um, that uh, education stream for yourself, the, the way that you move through the degree. Um, so we also have some opportunities to um, to work on some industry projects, which is a which is a really wonderful wonderful thing to to have, um, and you know, and and then that's work that's developed, and and it's also really um, an interesting perspective to be coming from it. Um, you know, working, having the opportunity to work with clients and listen to what it is that they need and or what they think they need sometimes, um, and and working within that often very rigid set of parameters that, that they set up is, is um, quite a contrast to some of the more spe speculative things that you might find yourself doing in studio. Um, and the skills then and the way of speaking and, and um, again these vocabularies and socialization into that, into that realm is, is you know, experience that 
experience an opportunity that that's a, a, a really wonderful thing that we're happy to be able to to be able to provide that um, as part of our coursework. Um, and you know I've talked about um, observing and understanding the spaces that you occupy but as designers we must also come to understand how others navigate space um, and be able to evaluate the environment you know, and different, and different ranges of users um, or readers of design uh, and support them to be able to, uh, to act or know or do something in response to, to their environment or the things that we're putting in front of them. Um, and to not only respond, but to respond in, in desired ways. To, so to be able to achieve their goal or to be able to, or to, to uh, inform somebody and change minds or, you know, change perspectives about, about certain situations or um, issues. Um, and, you know, alongside that, uh, we come to, um, you know, an idea about usability um, and also accessibility. So, you know, translating and transforming information to take something um, very complex and make it so that anyone can understand. Um, and that's that's a, a complicated and and um, and difficult thing. And thinking about uh, um, uh, can I see the next one, Robbie? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, thinking about contexts where um, someone might need to make a decision. So if we're looking at specific specific reading contexts, um, and um, you know, if you can think about situations where you know, somebody might might find themselves in a situation where they have to respond quickly and they have to respond correctly because they might be in an emergency, the situation might be life or death, or they might, um, you know, be um, be on a motorway and need to need to to take a, a quick turn and and not cause a backup of accidents. Um, and you know the the being able to support those decision those decisions in those in those um, fast and important situations is quite a different it's quite a different reading context and quite a different kind of user um, than you know if you think about what it's like to read in a cafe or what it's like to read at home uh, in in the privacy of your home and in and uh, in the quiet there. So. Um, Understanding then readers, readers and users' needs and desires and what they hope to achieve from things is is an important thing. Um, and again, looking at at how how we might view things from a distance or close up and how that changes context for things. Um, so um, you know, alongside things, uh, studio work. Um, in, in our studio classes and uh, studying abroad, there's also um, workplace opportunities um, to develop more of those professional skills and um, socialization then into um, professional practice. Um, uh, these are great opportunities uh, to see outcomes of your work um, and to see how it's living in space. Uh, and again, how then, um, it's people are responding to it. You know, part of um, um, being a, a, a practitioner um, is, uh, you know, what it, um, I guess, I guess constantly um, viewing and evaluating your work in a live environment um, and continually responding um, and adapting to environments um, and, and how people, people change or how the environment changes and seeing how work lives in environment provides um, a really inval invaluable opportunity for learning and continuing to evolve um, and continuing to better your practice and, and thinking about, about then the kind of designer you wanna be and the kind of designer that the world needs. So I might hand, hand back to Ravi to, to um, Discuss some some um, things about ATAR and yeah sure thanks Mara great yeah. 
Um, these are the last few slides in our talk tonight before we go on to questions. So if you do have a question, don't forget to type it into the chat so that Scott can take a look at it. Um, our, we, it's always nice to provide some numbers. Um, these are very common questions, so we like to just give them straight up. Um, so uh, our last year, our clearly in ATAR was 76.5. Um, and our only prerequisite in design is a study score of 25 in English. Um, I'm using the um, sort of local parlance here, but of course there are equivalents um, for uh, people coming in from different education systems. Um, we also do a thing called subject adjustment points, which is basically if you study one of the uh, subjects listed below in the gray, like product design or studio art, then um, these can potentially lift your score. And that's our way of recognizing that if you've done some prior study in design or related areas in high school, that uh, you're probably the kind of person that we want at MARTA. So um, there's a maximum of eight additional points that are available um, through that system. Um, we don't do folio and interview, just to follow up on that point, I suppose, around the subject bonusing. Um, we used to do this a long time ago, and we found that we had some great students, but we also found that we were turning away great students. And um, there's a thing that's very difficult to interview for, and that is passion and initiative. And if you have the drive to become a designer, you may not have a portfolio that reflects that. And um, we're increasingly, or we are now, of the view that that is the sort of person that we would like to, uh, to offer a place on our course to. And so that's why we don't do folios and interviews anymore. Um, so it's at our only entry, at our or equivalent, of course. Um, and we're happy to, to see your, your application. Um, naturally, for more information, you can head over to our website. There's lots of stuff on there. Um, you'll find information coming up on our website around our, how we're doing Open Day this year. Um, but of course, we also share things all the time on our website. So if you want to see what our students are doing um, and you want to do it on a slightly bigger screen than on your phone on Instagram, then our website does have more depth of information. Um, Scott, I think that's pretty much me done. So I'm going to hand back to you. Oh, no, the both of you aren't done yet. You've got a whole oh, lot of I'll questions to answer. <laughs> um, that was brilliant. Thank you both so much. Uh, I love working in Monash Art Design and Architecture because I feel really inspired and quite privileged to be with these inspiring designers. Just listening is great. So thank you both for sharing some insights on the courses that we offer. We've got a few questions that have come in from the audience, so keep them coming in and we'll answer them for you. So I'll throw the first one open uh, to either Robbie or Myra. But the student has asked, um, once they complete their bachelor, they can can they move on to a master's? But also they were interested in a double degree. So we do offer lots of double degree options with design in the course. Um, and as Robbie mentioned before, it's a three year bachelor degree in design. If you do a double degree, you add one more year on and you'd get two degrees in four years, which is really good. But I'll let Robbie talk about some of the options if you like. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, Mari, you can chime in if you, if you wish. Um, so yeah, look, double degrees. Ah, oh, gee, they're amazing. Um, <laughs> what we do, and uh, I would say that, wouldn't I? But no, they are amazing because here's the thing. Um, being a designer is really great. I, I'm, a, I'm a quite a single-minded industrial designer. Um, and I think if I had have had the opportunity to do a double degree, I probably would have. Um, because then I could have arguments with myself and it would be amazing. Um, as it is, I have to have arguments with other people about my designs. So the double degree options, uh, I can't remember all of them, but uh, they cover areas like media and film, uh, mechanical engineering, um, IT and business. And yes. the way we've structured those at Monash is, as Scott says, you can do a double degree in four years. Now, how do we do that? The trick is that in a single degree in three years, you get a lot of elective choices. And those are ways, as Myra illustrated, of deepening your knowledge in design or broadening your skills or kind of both, that's fine. In a double degree, you forego those electives and you get two degrees in four years. So that's how we, we fit them in there. So in effect, what you're doing is you're, you're taking all of your electives and putting them into another degree. So that's how we fit it into four years. So there's fewer choices as the degree goes on, but you get this massive choice at the beginning, which is actually to study two degrees in four years, which is pretty amazing. 
Um, just to touch on the other part of that question, which was around further study. Um, so the three-year degree is a bachelor's degree. Uh, I strongly encourage any student uh, to consider the fourth year of the degree, which is honours. Um, and what we're talking about there is an articulation into higher level degrees. So, and a, and a going from being just a practitioner, which is a great thing, by the way, to being a practitioner and a researcher, or someone who can operate in design at a slightly higher level. Um, so, as Scott illustrated, both Mara and myself have higher degrees in design. That's kind of our, our thing within the university. I'm not suggesting that everybody wants to become a university professor, but there are uh, particular jobs and types of work that will suit you if you have a higher degree, like an honours degree, which is one extra year, or a master's degree, which is two extra, or, hey, why not go for the whole thing and do a PhD in design? <laughs> Selling the dream. I love it. Yeah. That's fantastic. <laughs> I don't know if you remember right at the start of Robbie's presentation, Robbie mentioned uh, a beautiful image of a uh, ceramic reef that was built by one of the graduates. His name was yeah. Alex. He was an honours student and roughly, basically, honours, you get to spend a whole year working towards um, investigating an actual project and working with academics like Robbie and Myra to sort of go through all those kind of problems. So. That was yeah. a great outcome, which he is now going all around the world and saving marine life by building coral yeah, reefs. That's a good really point. It's a good point, Scott. But fourth year, more than third year, but fourth year, the honours year and masters are the opportunity that you have to, to shape your own project and, and therefore kind of make your own job, which is mm. pretty cool, like, yeah. um, like Alex has done. Absolutely. I might just, I might just add, a, add a little point to that as well, because, you know, the other side to that is... Um, you know, we're talking a lot about, about you know, the, the future of our world and research skills. So if, if you, do, you develop the, the practice skills in, in the undergraduate and you come on top of that with an honours degree, which is, a, which is a research degree. So you develop those, those early, um, early capacity to research. Um, the, the value of that to, to a design practice is is unparalleled these days, really, um, with the, the capacity to observe and challenge and, um, and investigate and respond with that kind of depth uh, is, is of tremendous value in being able to, to respond and address the kinds of problems that we're facing these days. Thank you, yeah, excellent answer. From both of you thank you so much um we'll kick on to another quick question um because we've got a few coming through uh we've got one here from jay robson which is basically is there support or pathways for the intersection between sound and audio so an open question there but students can look at sound and audio within our programs from communication design industrial design and even spatial um, and there's also as we've mentioned before electives i'm not too sure if you'd like to add anything in there about teaching areas around sound or audio there's also some electives in fine art that deal with that as well yeah look i'll i don't know a great deal about it but i'll share what i do know um I was speaking to our program director of spatial design yesterday, Chris, and he identified uh, this wonderful elective that he's just started running, which is called sensory design. Um, so, yay, there's the answer. Um, Chris, Chris's special, uh, Dr. Chris, of course, as I should say, Chris's specialization is actually um, uh, immaterial, in, in, uh, intangible things like sound, things you can't hold in your hand. Um, and so they've got this wonderful elective in spatial design around the effect, you know, kind of acoustics, the, the effect of sound on space, which is great. The other thing that I would respond to that question with is that we, one of our double degrees is communication and media. And the media side of that deals a lot with, um, with film, the moving image, and of course, sound production, radio, these kind of things. That's the basically media meaning. Broadcast journalism, yep. Yeah, broadcast journalism. Thank you. That's the right word, Scott. Oh. <laughs> so there is, there is part of that in there. That is now, you know, it's interesting because, you know, communication design is such a visual um, uh, medium. Um, and then to couple it with things that are, that are less visual, that are broadcast, um, so like radio. Uh, or podcasts is, is quite amazing as well. So it's not a specific sound design degree. It's not that kind of thing, but it is, it is a media uh, double degree with communication design. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for the question, JJ. So there's lots of options. Um, 
this next question from Daniel really ties in. Um, and it's really about what kind of choice do we have with electives? So basically through the presentation, there was um, conversations about electives and core units. Basically, uh, as one of the slides Robbie had up before was in your studios, you learn the fundamental technical skills um, around design, design thinking, learning how to um, use things like InDesign, Adobe, Photoshop, uh, 3D printers, robotics, all those kind of things. And then you supplement it with electives. So electives are where you can really um, pursue your interests. Uh, we've got specific electives within the faculties, anything from advertising to design, typography, branding, design thinking. Um, there's just hundreds of them. And then from there, you can actually go out into the university, all of Monash, and you might supplement it with an elective from medicine or from the uh, arts faculty or from business. So uh, the way the programs are structured allows you to really um, gain fundamental skills in design and then um, pursue your interests or yes, mm. which is quite good. I've got, a, I've got a case study on that, which is Ooh, that, okay, go. Uh, one of my students, um, Tal from a few years ago, he actually just finished a master's degree. So he's, a, he's another answer to the previous question. Tal, when he was an industrial design student, I was always fascinated because his electives were jazz, actually jazz. He, he went to, to our, the Sir Zelman Cowan School of Music and studied jazz for his industrial design electives. And I thought that's really cool. Um, Did he end up like being a product design for... I'm sorry, I stole your thunder. Go no, ahead. no, it's fine because his his masters was in the development of of innovative new musical instruments. I mean, it's it's just great. You know, he awesome. did stuff that I just couldn't conceive of. So, just to to I suppose add an example to what Scott was saying, the the idea of of really adding on some some point of difference for you in your career and and what kind of job you might want to get is is pretty cool through electives. One, if you're in a single degree, one third of the degree, that is one third of the units you'll study are electives. So there's a huge amount of choice. Yeah, and you know, you think about um, uh, what it is that designers do, which is, you know, shape our environment. Um, understanding people is, is such a huge part of that. So, you know, the opportunity to look at sociology, psychology, um, um, anthropology would, would shape the way that you think about about those environments in in such a in a in a really profound way uh and beautifully segued myra into the question that caroline had asked which was um the interest if she can do psychology as an elective or a minor monash does offer psychology you can do it as an elective one of the big things around the way that our monash design program is structured is it's around human-centered design is at the center of everything so a great combination there between design and psychology uh, we'll kick on to uh, next question, which I might answer, which is basically, can I transfer into semester two of architecture design after finishing my first semester of design? Uh, you can apply to move into architecture if you've done design at Monash. They look at what kind of grade point average you're getting. So that basically means you need to get roughly, I think it's like 65 or 70 percent across all of your subjects. Um, to then be able to start the process um, to move across for design. So I hope that helps. Anonymous? Yes. And that's a two-way, that, just to, to add something to that, Scott, that's a two-way street as well. So when I interview students who want to transfer into design from architecture, I do the same thing. I look at their grades. Uh, absolutely. Um, and when you're working with such uh, great academics and designers, I think that kind of uh, mark is easy to achieve. Uh, oh, so no, next... so easy. We, we, our students do have to work hard. Oh, yeah, I should, yep, you've got to apply, applied work, yes, <laughs> absolutely, during, during studio time at home, absolutely. Definitely achievable though. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to I'm going to hit you both with a big, big question here now. So thank you very much. Anonymous has sent this one in as well. But thank you. Um, given the current situation, what is your opinion on the future of the design industry? We'll start in Australia, you can even branch out overseas. This is a great question. Of the design industry, or, you know, because design industry is, is shifting and changing. Um, quite a lot and and you know the capacity of designers to move to move across 
any range of discipline is is you know part of part of what we what we do so you know the 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 way that the world is these days i they're design problems you know the problems that we're having are design problems and so you know science science can can resolve the problem but without designers those problems can't be translated into solutions that people can use so um you know in in you know I, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a big question isn't it, it, is a big it. Question. you know I, I but i you know i think um yeah i think i think a design designer are 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 going to be um just the, the value of design is going to be increasing mm. i don't know i don't know if you want to add that. to that Mm, sure. Um, look, yeah, I think that's a great answer. It's it's almost it, it's a wonderful question, by the way. Um, it's almost too big to answer, but I'm going to give it mm. a try anyway. Um, so the OECD identified some of the more sought after skills in university graduates in coming years, and as as they look further into the future, creative problem solving uh, goes from number three on that list to number one, and I think there's two reasons for that. The first reason Myra has already covered, which is stuff's getting hard in the world, if I may be so blunt. Um, the second part of the answer is that creative problem solving, um, creating meaningful solutions that humans will, will want to do, is probably going to be the last thing that AI, that we figure out how to get AI to do. So um, while the, you know, the government website can pretty much do my tax for me at the moment, um, there's there's a bunch of stuff that AI is kind of creeping up on, but it would it would seem to the the OECD that that creative problem solving is going to be kind of hard. Um, I'm not just, not going to say it's never going to happen, but those are two reasons why it's at the top of the list. Um, the the state of the the design industry. I'll just pick up on on one other part of that question, which is it's kind of it relates to what I said at the beginning of the presentation. We find that our graduates are now getting different types of jobs. They're getting the, there's the same jobs we've always had. We've had designers going out and becoming graphic designers and industrial designers and typographers. That, that still goes on. But we're seeing this additional uh, employment stream where I'm seeing a lot of industrial design graduates who are making early career moves and ending up in really interesting places like uh, government departments or banks or startups that didn't even exist a year ago. And what they're doing there is they're doing creative problem solving. So um, Commonwealth Bank has a huge in-house design team now. They didn't have that a few years ago. And the reason for that is because they want to find out ways to make banking uh, you know, easier. They want their products to be more appealing to other people. They can't really change the interest rate on their loans, but they can make it easy to do banking on your phone. So there's design, the value of design is popping up in areas that I think 20 years ago we wouldn't have dreamed of. Um, and Robbie's probably in a really good position to answer this as well because his role as deputy, as dean, sorry, in education for design means that he's helping shape the actual courses that you'll move into and study. And part of the foundation of the design course is this idea around developing specialised knowledge and skills in, in design thinking and problem solving and providing these creative solutions to challenging local and global design problems. So as a Monash grad, you're really sort of well situated to move across multiple disciplines locally and overseas. You guys do a really good job of setting up all the students. Thank you. Oh, well, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> the, the shape of our students we, we aim for and we, we think we achieve is the T-shaped student. They uh, have some general knowledge. That's the top of the T. And then they also have depth of knowledge. And that's what goes down um, to make somebody a, a, a designer with real grunt, I suppose. Cool. Uh, thank you. Another question from Anonymous. I'm not too sure if it's the same Anonymous or there's several Anonymous out there, <laughs> but we'll move into this one. Spatial design, which is an interesting term so we can deconstruct it, but they're asking what is the difference between spatial design, interior design, interior architecture? How does spatial design relate to architecture? Sure. Uh, I can give that a go if you like. Um, so uh, that uh, anonymous, thank you for the question. It's one we get a lot at this time of year. It's a great question. Um, so we used to have a degree called interior architecture 
Um, that degree exists in our Department of Architecture. As its name suggests, it's architectural practice, but it's within the interior realm. So it's a different uh, part of the built environment. So, you know, spaces. Um, now, different terms get used to describe that profession. Um, interior architecture, interior design, some people use those terms interchangeably. Um, they both aim to differentiate from another part of that discipline, which is called interior decoration. All of these things make up well-resolved um, interiors. And of course, interiors are what are inside well-resolved buildings. So there's, there's a structure there. Now, spatial design is in the Department of Design. It's, it's something that, that's within the remit of today's talk. And what Monash, what we decided to do in our faculty was to finish teaching the interior architecture degree. So we, don't ex we no longer accept students into that degree and we're, we're finishing teaching that one because um, we wanted to start a new one called spatial design. The fundamental difference is that spatial design stands on its own in its own right, rather than being part of architecture. That is to say that a spatial design graduate is just as likely as an interior architecture graduate to get a job at an architecture firm doing that kind of work, but it opens the um, scope of what that person can do. They're no longer limited to the interior. There's a whole bunch of projects which are exterior spatial design. They relate to landscape architecture, they relate to festivals and experiences that are still spatial in their qualities, but they are not matters of interior architecture. So it's kind of a subtle difference, but if I was gonna to point to one thing, it's that the, the scope of um, spatial design is far more open than that of interior architecture. Um, and I think Robbie hit on a really key term there um, with the use of the word experience. Um, which means that it just, uh, as a spatial designer, experience is somewhat at the centre of a lot of what you do. Again, moving back to that idea around human-centred design or humans at the centre of design, um, which then means that you can move... You, you're only limited by your ideas. We give you the skills and the technology to be able to then move across all these particular areas. So it's, it's a new term, a relatively new, I guess, would you say? Like, yeah, yeah, look, I would, and, and that, that's kind of the reason. So, and that's why it's a great question, because we did go out there with a bit of a new term um, for that specialization, but um, the question actually is really good. It means people are, are, are thinking differently about it. Excellent. Um, I am conscious of time, so we've got a few questions to go. Uh, there's one here about Bachelor of Architecture and what is the ATAR. So, uh, Bachelor of Architecture, the ATAR there is 82.6, I believe. Um, but as you know, with ATARs, it may fluctuate up or down a little bit. So you need to aim for that. ATAR, like, um, sorry, architecture, like our design degree, uh, is ATAR only entry or equivalent. So there's no uh, folio or interview. And similar reasons to what Robbie gave before, they're looking for people who um, are, curi are curious, ideas, thinking, interested in the um, in, uh, built environment, in design, and what happens around. Um, and then when you come in, like design in first year, will teach you the foundation skills to be able to uh, then move into second and third year. Uh, we've sort of, there was another question here about graduate employability and the kind of jobs that they're getting. Uh, interesting question, but maybe you can, if there's a few alumni you might, two or three alumni you might like to suggest or jobs or careers, traditional or unexpected maybe? I'm sorry, throw you, throw you in that one there. Yeah, it, no, it's a great question. It's kind of the, the question of the day really when at seminars like this. I think, um, yeah, employability. Look, uh, um, I, it's really hard to list um, people and, and things because designers these days, they end up everywhere. Doing design, by the way, they're not flipping burgers, they're doing design. This is, it's incredible. Um, one, of, one of our industrial design graduates from a long time ago has never designed a physical product, but he has gone from um, uh, Facebook to Spotify to, to all these different uh, brands that have products, it's just that they're not physical. So, so he, he leads the UX development of, um, of Spotify. So, you know, there's, there's some really cool jobs that we just didn't conceive of a, a number of years ago. What do you think, Myra, uh, for new jobs and, and places where people go? Yeah, you know, Robbie, I think, I think that you touched on it uh, earlier in one of your responses um, to one of the other questions where 
um, you know, it was the skills that, that we're developing as part of the design degree are, are what's valuable to any range of industry, right? So I think it's, um, I agree with you. I think that designers have, be, have the capacity to move across a range of things. And part of one of the really important things they do is, is act as facilitators and even being able to bring things, bring people together in order to, to work on and, uh, and move between, between industries for larger projects. Um, but, you know, I think that the, with the range of skills that, 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 we're, that we're building as, as part, of, part of the design degree enables, enables designers to go to, go to, any, go to a number of places. Um, and I think that it's a matter of, of, um, of thinking broadly. You know, of of thinking, what is it that I really want to do, and and um, and then applying those design skills to that thing. Because um, you know, if you think about um, you know everything everything that we're that we're interacting with is is in in um, you know in the made world is design. And so so if 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 you are recognizing that and looking, you know, even the way that I interact with my space or each or you know, the way that I interact with you right now, or, you know, with Robbie when we're at, when we're at, on campus, those, those are designed experiences and the spaces that we do that within are designed as well. And so I think it's, it's recognizing that, that, that how I move through the world is, is, is designed and I can be part of building that. It's, it's just looking at, at, at where I might, where I might be able to apply those skills. That's such a great way of explaining that as you move through the world, everything is designed. I was also actually going to ask you, Myra, um, are you noticing any shifts or trends or new emerging kinds of like jobs or roles in that area of communication design or in that field? Um, you know, I think that I think there are absolutely the traditional jobs still existing. You know, we're never we're never going to not be without books. And you know, books are books are also just moving on to digital apparatuses or apparatuses. Is that even the right word? But digital objects. Yeah. So you know, so the 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 idea of of reading is never going to change. It's just it's just the action that we take to read changes, and then how we design for that. So, um, so I think all those traditional kinds of um, jobs are existing, but I also see um, a lot more interest or need for communication designers in terms of, of um, you know, translating and transforming information, you know, things like, um, you know, really complex things, you know, medicine is, is uh, increasing, is increasingly in, and not just because of COVID and the situation that we're in, but issues around medicines and, um, and those sorts of situations are increasingly important. And, um, you know, the value of then a communication designer to um, interpret and translate information and then transform it in ways, visual ways, um, all sorts of audio, experiential, any kind of way to improve then comprehension and um, an understanding of, of that is, uh, I, I, so I think, so I guess long story short, I think um, designing information is, is, um, is certainly a, a really important area and that can look like a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things. Um, absolutely. Anything from wayfinding to yeah, the way people are communicating and just that uh, skill to be able to translate words into a visual language. Mm. Such an amazing talent to have. Um, I think that's about it for all of the questions. There was another one from JJ uh, about whether they can engage in composition, music technology in an arts music stream. Uh, if you're studying a design program, it goes back to um, what Robbie and Myra were talking about with electives. You can look and if they offer electives in those particular areas, you can um, supplement your design studies in that area of music or composition. Absolutely. Um, so yes. Oh, there is one more question that has popped up from somewhere. Oh, sorry. Let's have a look. That's another question. This is this is a big question, so I'll throw it open to you both. What happens in the studios and how do they enhance the knowledge of the students? Ooh. Ooh, it's a big question, but I think I've got a simple answer. Um, 
the studio is is the doing. Um, I, I teach in studio and um, we get in there, we, I set briefs, we design to the briefs, they're hard. We make a whole lot of mistakes and we learn a whole lot of stuff and we produce things along the way and at the end. Mm. How's that? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. But, yeah. but, but basically, uh, the studio is the doing of design. I should say when we use the term studios, it's um, basically like a class. Um, what you might be familiar with in secondary school. Uh, unlike other, uh, something special to Monash, I should say, is that our studios are relatively small. So they could range anywhere from 15 to maybe 20, 25 people. You might get some exceptions to that. Um, but the benefit of that is that you get to know like your lecturers and the academics like Myra or Robbie um, and begin to develop a professional relationship there where you can explore areas of design. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's about the doing, it's about learning all those kind of things. And they can be, studios can be projects that are either simulated. So they might be something around the imagination, something to do with outer space, or they could be based in a real life situation where you're working with a designer who has come in from an outside firm to lecture in to a studio subject for a semester. So you might be lucky enough to work on a brief that they're working with a real life external company. So I think that again rolls also back to the idea about employment. We're setting people up by getting them to meet and build a network of design, is design industry people in Australia and overseas um, to help them secure employment prior to or on their way to graduation. Hmm. Um, uh, I will ask, I'm not too sure of this one, is there a design mentor program or tutor or uh, I, I guess all the individual academics acts as mentors? Um, yeah, we do, uh, we have open doors, but um, I think Mart is a small faculty and I wear that as a badge of honour and um, we have a lot of student interaction. So I, I see a lot of um, students in their junior years talking to older students um, in more advanced years of study, which is kind of cool as well. Mm. We do have an official mentor program, um, which helps students if they identify as being at risk for particular reasons too, which is nice. Yeah. Um, that's less academic and more of a, a general support, actually. So, yeah, it's a, it's a nice environment. Yeah, absolutely. There are official university mentoring programs, but I think the beauty of studying at somewhere like Monash in art design and architecture, which is different from some of the other institutes, is again that professional relationship you begin to build with your lecturers, again, like Robbie and Myra, um, where it almost becomes a situation where you're learning from their uh, experience because they both work on uh, projects outside of the university that are, that are real life and research as well. Um, I am conscious of the time, so I will say thank you very much for every, to everyone for attending this evening's session uh, and also for the great questions that you came in. I see a lot of potential future designers in there with their thinking and their innovative ways that they're approaching uh, asking these questions, which is great. So thank you very much. A big thank you both to Myra and Robbie for taking the time to share their experience with you, which is great. Designers are the best. Um, <laughs> thank you all so much. Um, for those of you, as we were speaking a lot about jobs and employability, there's another in case you're not zoomed out, we've got another Inside Monash happening on the 29th of July, and that's dealing with unexpected careers in design, looking at in and around the health industry. One of our, indust again, another industrial designer, Dr. Nayan Ung, I think is how you pronounce his last name, um, who's an industrial designer within, a, there's a research lab within Monash called the Design Health Collab, which looks at design in the area of health. He's speaking and sharing some of his experiences. So information's on our website, but uh, I'll make sure that that's in the email that you will get um, tomorrow, thanking you for attending and giving you more information about the courses that we offer here at Monash. So thank you all so much. Thank you again, Robbie and Myra and Erin, who's back of house helping with all the questions. Thank you so much. And thank you, Scott. Yes. You're welcome. It was a pleasure listening to you both. Loved it. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, goodbye, everybody. Thank you all so much. Um, enjoy your evening. Stay safe out there um, and with the rest of your studies. And we'll see you hopefully again. Oh, we'll chat to you maybe online at Open Day or maybe on the 29th at the Unexpected Careers in Health.
Thank Thanks. you, everyone. Bye. Goodbye.